This morning we're going to begin a new sermon series that's going to look at the covenants that God has made throughout time. Uh, We find covenants all throughout the Old Testament. But before we even start, and I think the first thing we have to note is this, that the God of creation that we saw last week never changes. He never changes. The God of the universe is the perfect promise keeper. He doesn't lie. He doesn't go back on his word because he can't. His holiness makes it impossible for him to do that. And so when we come across one of these covenants that God makes, we can rest assured that he will keep his end of the bargain. And we use that sort of terminology because covenants are essentially, they're they're contracts. They're they're formal binding agreements between two parties. Uh, Examples of a covenant today would be a marriage vow uh, or legal promises to do or not to do something. In the ancient cultures, a covenant was was a more solemn thing. They, they were sanctioned by an oath, a commitment to follow all the stipulations spelled out in the covenant. And scripture, we see a few different types of covenants that are sanctioned through oaths and sacrifices. And they typically stipulate the benefits for observing the covenant and also the consequences for not observing it. Someday I would encourage you all, when you're reading the book of Deuteronomy, to to see that the bulk of it really reads like a covenant, like a contract. It's filled with with promises and blessings, along with declarations of negative consequences for breaking the covenant. But for now, we're going to stick with the covenants that we see God initiating uh, in Scripture. And as I was working on this sermon this week, I, I, I had to stop for a minute and I asked myself, isn't it interesting that all the covenants in Scripture are all initiated by God. You don't read of anyone in Scripture going to God with a covenant that requires him to do something. And there's a simple reason for that. He's God, and we're not. (laughs) He isn't subservient to anyone. And who would we be to spell out consequences to him? We always, and we always have to remember one simple thing. God is sovereign over us. We can't command or demand anything from him. So when we hear these covenants, we have to be humble enough to know that he's doing it all by his grace. He doesn't owe anyone anything. Now think of the creation we heard all last week. He did it all. He did something we can't. And he did it all for mankind. We owe him everything. And one last thing for us to mention before all of this is is the school of thought of of covenantal theology. Some of you may may have heard of that at some point. Basically what covenantal theology says is that uh, there are at least two covenants in play. The covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Uh, The covenant of works is seen as the time before the fall of Adam and Eve when God simply told them to live their lives in the garden. And Jesus, he said, just don't eat the fruit from that tree, because if you do, you'll die. So it's interpreted as a covenant from God. You don't do this, and I won't do that. And after the fall, when God told Eve that one of her offspring would crush the head of the serpent, that was the introduction of the covenant of grace, which extends to now. So, so sure, in a way, I can, I can buy all that covenant of works. You don't do this, I won't do that. And then now we're under the covenant of grace. I could certainly buy that. But I would simply say that as we go forward in these, looking at these covenants, what we're going to see is that these, the covenants themselves actually reveal God's grace. And it reveals his redemptive plan for salvation for mankind. So yes, when you think about it, all these covenants, they all show the grace of God. So in the coming weeks, we're just going to look at them as they appear in Scripture. And the first one that we see appears in the ninth chapter of Genesis as God enters into a covenant with Noah. But before we go too much further, let me just, let me just pray for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do, uh, we do worship you this morning. We exalt you this morning as we just sang. And we pray, Lord, you'd reveal more of your grace to us as we, we study and we hear from you uh, 
uh, regarding these covenants you made with mankind throughout time. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless these things into our hearts and transform our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. So a little background on the Noahic covenant uh, will help us to understand what this covenant is all about. Um, quite some time had passed after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, and quite a few humans had inhabited the earth by that time, and it became pretty wicked. Wicked to the point where God was sorry he had even created mankind. I mean, think about it, that's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> And so God, not wanting to give up entirely on mankind, because, as you recall from last week, mankind is the pinnacle of his creation. And and creation was all created to give mankind a place. So he didn't want to give up on mankind. So God comes to Noah, who we're told God saw to be a righteous and blameless man who walked with God. It does not say he was sinless. God's word says Noah was blameless in that he feared God. He was righteous in that he lived to please God. And it says he walked with God. He was faithful to God. And think about it, back then there was no law. No no Ten Commandments yet. (laughs) But certainly the image bearers of God had to know right from wrong. And yet mankind, all of mankind, became wicked. And that is the ongoing effect of original sin. So God decides he'll destroy it all saved for a number of animals and Noah's family. And he'll destroy it all through a worldwide flood. Now we know the account well. We know the story well, and and I think it's appropriate here for us to say that the story of Noah and the ark is not a kid's story. It's not a cute little story of of Noah building this little boat and, and saving a bunch of cute little animals. It's actually a terrifying account of the wrath of God being poured out on a world that completely rejected him. It's an account of mankind living as if there was no God, receiving what they deserved. It's an account of what every one of us rightly deserves if it weren't for Jesus. And when we read the the flood account and how the rains came and the waters came from the earth and completely covered the entire earth, we can see just how complete the wrath of God is. Not one creature, human or otherwise, survived the flood. Only the creatures aboard the ark survived. The description of how the flood came to its end echoes the words of the creation in Genesis 1. The waters covered the entire earth. Then God sent a wind, a ruach, like we saw last week, to cause the waters to recede. And as the waters receded, the land appeared. Noah set out a couple of birds, and one returned with an olive branch. So vegetation had returned. So God, in his divine providence, recreated the world. Sort of a a cosmic do-over. But the original sin of Adam and Eve remained in Noah and his family. So, So this time around, it would be a little different. When God instructed them to come out of the ark, as we heard earlier, they they all came out. And the first thing Noah did was to build an altar and offer a sacrifice of clean animals to the Lord. Now, this is the first mention of clean versus unclean animals. So how did Noah know the difference? Well, some surmise that being a blameless man, God probably communicated it to him in one way or another. I mean, if God gave him the blueprints to build this huge ark, something that was never built before... Clearly, he could have told him about clean and unclean animals and what they meant. The point is here, Noah offered up a sacrifice. Noah worshipped God. And God was pleased. And we're told in Genesis 8 that God said, in his heart, in his heart. So we're given a glimpse into the heart of God. And in response to Noah's act of worship... God says to himself, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. And then the chapter ends in prose, actually. We sang it in one of the songs earlier. It quotes God as saying, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So this is God's thinking as the sacrifice of worship comes to him. That's how important our worship of God is. I mean, can you hear the love of God in these words? Can you hear his compassion upon his creation? Can you sense 
how God is pleased with worship. That's how important it is for us to worship him. But notice that he says, as long as the earth endures. That's a foreshadow of Revelation 21, where John the Apostle tells us of a new heaven and a new earth. The old one with all of its sin and wickedness will be destroyed to be replaced by a new earth. And in Revelation 22, we read of the restoration of Eden and the tree of life. So all of that, all of that is to serve as a background for the actual covenant with Noah that we take up now in chapter 9 of Genesis. So that's where we're going to go first. Genesis chapter 9. Beginning in verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground, and on all the fish in the sea. They are given to your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it, and for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply in the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that come out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and a rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. The first thing we see in that is this is a one-way covenant. This is, this is what we would call a royal grant type of covenant. There aren't any stipulations connected to it. Noah doesn't have to do anything. This is God making an unconditional promise to Noah and all of his offspring, which means all of mankind. That's what this is. Now let's take a look at the structure of this covenant. First, it begins with a blessing. It says, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Where have we heard that before? Well, that was in Genesis 1. So again, we're hearing the echoes of the original creation from the creator himself. But something changes here. God says to Noah that man will be feared and dreaded by all animals. Now why is that? What changed? We recall that after the fall, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. It was a perfect paradise on earth where God ruled over man and man ruled over all the animals. But as man transgressed and hearts became more sinful and turned away from God, turning away from man's assigned role in the perfect order of creation, the animals no doubt followed suit, living without fear of man, leaving mankind in a pretty vulnerable position when you think about it. And so God now reorders things because of mankind's sinful nature. The dominion over the animals is restated, but now the animals are added to man's diet. And God is the one that says, I give them to you. But mankind now has the power of life and death over the animals. It's changed. In a way, it sort of protects mankind from the animals. Then God says, don't eat anything that has lifeblood in it. And he connects that to the sanctity of human life. Life is in the blood. We read that in Leviticus 17. 
And when you think about it, it's appropriate on this Sunday that we're talking about the sanctity of human life. God says here, this is long before the issuance of the Ten Commandments, for your lifeblood I will demand an accounting. Some translations say I will require a reckoning. And so what we see here is the introduction of capital punishment, which is stipulated later on in the law. So if someone murders someone, they were to be executed because the sanctity of human life is so valuable to God because mankind is created in his image. So a murderer demonstrates contempt for God. That's how important this is. We have to think that prior to the flood and all the wickedness and rejection of God's order, his perfect order, there was a genuine fear for life itself. So here God is reordering things to remove that fear. Just like in the new heaven and the new earth, God will reorder things. It'll be a place where there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more tears. And we notice later on in verse 7, a repeat of verse 1's blessing. So those, those two verses form an inclusio. You've heard that term before. It's like this literary parentheses around a passage that contain the idea of the sanctity of life. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. It's the blessing of God upon mankind. And now we come to the statement of the covenant. And there are two parts to it. The first is the oath. The oath of the covenant. The second is the sign of the covenant. Now the oath comes from God. And it's interesting how God says it to Noah and his sons. Not just Noah. Noah and his sons. We know from the wording of the covenant promise God made that it was made to Noah and all of his descendants. And by saying this to Noah and his sons seems to cement that idea. Noah and his direct descendants heard the covenant directly. And they could pass it on through the generations. And the promise was to never destroy all life by the waters of a flood. No one has to do anything. There aren't any conditions attached to it. It's simply God saying he would never flood the earth again. Dare I say, if you look around today, that God has kept his promise? Has there been a worldwide flood since? I mean, there have been areas that have been flooded. But there hasn't been a worldwide flood. Nothing to the extent of this. There have been no floods that have covered mountains. God in his holy and divine providence has kept his covenant. And if we think back to what we said earlier, and we sang it earlier, the seasons, the hot, the cold, summer, winter, they're all still working in accordance to the order that God set them in. He's kept his promise, and he will forevermore. That won't change. Now also, covenants come with a sign. That they come with, with some sort of a, a certification of the covenant. And, and as we go through all the covenants, we're going to see those. But the sign here in this one is the rainbow. A rainbow being something that forms after it rains. After waters have come down from the sky above. Isn't it amazing how whenever anyone sees a rainbow, they're amazed to see it? Right? You just take in its natural beauty. White light dividing into all of its components. It's like the purity of God and the incredible depth of God being put on display for all to see. You know, the, the, the rainbow appears throughout Scripture. The great prophet Ezekiel saw the throne of God. And in the end of the first chapter of Ezekiel, we read this. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli, and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. And I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if, as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Yeah. Now in Revelation chapter 4, you're probably familiar with this passage, we read this. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, 
And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone around like an emerald and circled the throne. Yes, the glory of God, the fullness of the glory of God is depicted in a rainbow. The Hebrew word used in this covenant is the word kasheth, which is a bow, as in bow and arrow, as in a battle weapon. And as you observe a rainbow, you notice one thing. If it's a bow, it's facing away from the earth. No longer will God use the bow of floodwaters to destroy life. It's no longer aimed at life on earth. It's as if God hung up the bow. And now we see it that way. So that sign is to serve as a reminder of the pledge that God has made to not send a deluge ever again. Now what we see in this covenant is the grace of God upon mankind. Even though Noah and his family carried inherited sin, even though mankind would continue to rebel against their creator, even though no one would be righteous and seek God, even though the word of God would become flesh and come unto his own and his own would not even acknowledge him, God, in his mercy, in his grace, has kept his promise. We can rest in that fact. We can, we can be assured that God keeps all of his promises. This should give you great hope because we know that the Lord Jesus will return. And we know that the day of the Lord will be a day of terror for many and a day of salvation for those who are walking with him, those who are blameless in him, those upon whom his righteousness has been given. Jesus said it this way. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So my dear friends, the, the, those who do not know the Lord Jesus, those who have not surrendered to his lordship, who reject God, those who continue to live in sin, this is how they will meet their end. The day of the Lord will be a day like no other. The day Jesus returns will be a day like no other. I just want to read uh, from 2 Peter. And I'm not, there's no need to comment on it. I think we just need to hear what Peter said. 2 Peter chapter 3. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You want to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant understand and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard, so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be
be glory both now and forever. Amen. That's a powerful passage, isn't it? That's powerful. But it, it comes with a charge, right? It comes with a charge to, to be, be holy, to live holy lives. And that really is our encouragement. We should take encouragement from that passage. The flood account and the gracious covenant that God made there is to point to the work of Jesus to save repentant sinners from the wrath of God. We're to continue walking as Noah did, seeking to be blameless, seeking to walk with him, seeking to remain faithful and obedient to him. We're saved in Christ, saved from the outpouring of God's wrath in Christ. And the word of God contains this warning to all who reject him. Repent. Repent. Acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and turn to God. Receive the mercy found in the blood, the lifeblood of Jesus Christ. You know, if you, if you survey the world today and it's flat-out rejection of God, filled with all sorts of wickedness, and you look at the state of the church, particularly in the West, it's becoming more and more worldly. And you hear of wars, and you hear of rumors of wars, and you hear of earthquakes, and you hear of other natural disasters, and you hear of famines, and floods, and viruses, and you see the moral decay of mankind. You can almost hear the words of the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of Romans. God gave them up. He gave them up. Do you think that God is at the point he was before the flood? you think his heart is deeply troubled? you think he's saddened that he made mankind? Our charge is to draw near to God. Draw near to him. Draw near to the one who saved you from his wrath. Draw near to the cross. Cling to the cross of Christ. Keep your eyes fixed upon him. You are safely in the ark. That is Christ. And just when you think about it, when it was only Noah's family that was saved, few, few were safe. And many were destroyed. Jesus said, enter the, through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. He has called you unto himself. He is the way. And you can rest assured that he will keep every promise he has made to you. Because you belong to him. And while his word clearly says that he will return and that final vengeance over Satan and sin are his, you, you will be in glory with him. You will be in a place that he's prepared for you. You will have a seat at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You will be with the multitude singing worship and praise to him who sits on the throne. And you will see that glorious rainbow. So also, as, as, as Jay mentioned earlier, we should always be ready to give a reason for the hope you have. Proclaim the gospel. Proclaim that Jesus is coming. Proclaim who you have faith in. Because by doing so, God may just use your voice and the words he puts in your mouth to bring an eternal blessing upon someone. We're called to do that. So again, we marvel, marvel at the rainbow, the promise of God. We honor the sanctity of human life. And we take heart that, that God is the ultimate promise keeper and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. We acknowledge that you are sovereign over your creation. <laughs> Who are we that you are mindful of us? And yet, we see in your word that you created it all for us. Your love, your compassion is just beyond our understanding. And so, Lord, I pray that from this day forward, as we leave this place and when the rains return... And we see rainbows. Not only do we marvel at the beauty of them, but we marvel that they reveal you. Every facet of who you are. And they remind us of your grace and your mercy and your compassion for us. 
So, Lord, may we see the rainbow that way. May we see that your promises are kept. That every promise and covenant you entered into, you keep. And that gives us great hope. That gives us great hope. And so, Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your holiness. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us. And that we would continue to draw closer to you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.